So without further ado, it is 10.02, I'm going to get started. And I'm gonna start with an introduction. My name is Rachel and I coordinate the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisor Program. And this is a regional extension program that's funded by the local governments or the local regional governments, regional district of East Kootenai, West Kootenai, Central Kootenai and Columbia Basin Trust. I'm joining you today from the West Kootenai, the traditional unceded territory of the Tanaha and Sinaiaks. And it is my absolute pleasure today to bring together a group of fabulous people working on cover cropping, some in the field, some in the lab, and some with regional extension. We have Serena Black with BC Forage Council, and she's gonna be giving you a short introduction about how we arrived today at this cover crops event. We also have Jillian Baynard from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and she'll be providing us with a presentation on her work and what she's been learning and extending to producers. And we also have Erin Harris, producer from Preston Valley, of Kootenai Meadows Organic Dairy Farm. And she's gonna be sharing with you photos and experiences, experiences from what she's been trialing in her fields. And as she said last night, she's been going through her cropping logs and has become excited by some of that information to share with you today. So the order of events is we're gonna hear from Serena and then we're gonna do a round table of introductions to see who's joining us from where, what you're growing and what you want to learn about today. And then we'll pass it over to Jillian and lastly to Erin, and then we can stay online for questions and answers. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Serena. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you everybody for joining in today uh, for this webinar. I'm very excited to be here. As Rachel uh, introduced, my name is Serena Black and I am the general manager of the BC Forage Council. The, the BC Forage Council is a Provincial Producer Association and a lot of our bread and butter right now is focused on research and extension and knowledge transfer. So we have a lot of different programs going on and I've had the absolute pleasure of also being one of the Forage Council's research coordinators as of late. So part of this project is coming out of the work that I've partnered with the Kootenai Boundary Farm Advisors with and on pasture rejuvenation. So focusing specifically on different no-till pasture rejuvenation projects. And with the support of uh, and funding from the Investment Agriculture Foundation, the BC Forage Council, and the Canadian Forage and Grassland Association, we were able to set up eight different research plots throughout the Kootenai and Boundary region and had three growing seasons, uh, two growing seasons for some when uh, Sometimes the funding windows don't always line up in time to get, get into the field that first year. And we had a lot of really great lessons from those fields. So it's actually technically wrapping up uh, in supposed to be this month, March, but we'll be actually needing about a six month extension to finish up all the material development uh, and resources. So you'll still be hearing more about the results of those uh, of all of those farms and their trials. And that will include uh, a podcast series, uh, a lot of fact sheets and case studies, and some really hopefully helpful information on pasture rejuvenation. The way we set up the trial was that each farm co collaborator got to choose specifically what they were interested in trialing out in, in part of their pasture rejuvenation system. And a couple of them did choose cover crops. Uh, so what we're really focused on coming out of those lessons there was making sure that we can spread that information wider. And from the conversations with our farm partners, they really wanted more information, which led to uh, us uh, KBFA and BC Forage Council coming here for this webinar today. So. I'm going to share the Forage Council website in the chat. If you have any um, any interest in the Forage Council, if you haven't renewed your membership yet, we're $50 a year per operation and run from January to December. So being a member is the best way uh, to keep in touch with all of our activities and events going on. Um, but we also share with KBFA. So hopefully uh, you'll get the information one way or the other. So yeah, a quick introduction from the Forage Council side. Great, thank you so much, Serena. And um, it's been really great having the Forage Council expand their capabilities to work with producers across the province over the last five years. And we appreciate your efforts to enhance agricultural extension around the area and include the <laughs> Um, So I am gonna ask everybody to introduce themselves. If you don't want to, it's totally fine. Just put in the chat, I'm good, or just don't answer when I call out your name. So because I see a Brady Crunch screen, I'm gonna call out your names. And the reason I ask folks to introduce themselves is we have lost a lot by not being able to do in-person workshops. And 
it's really helpful for the presenters to feel like they're speaking to somebody. And part of extension, oh, I have a room full of kids, so I'm gonna keep my microphone off. Yeah, Katie, no problem. And Katie's uh, works with the Kootenai Livestock Association, so thanks for joining. But, um, you know, online has offered us so much um, in regards to how much we can extend information, but we've also lost a lot when producers don't know who else is on the call. So thanks for introducing yourselves. I'll call out your name. Um, I see Doug's face, Doug. Oh, you're muted. Unmute, there we go. Good morning, I'm Doug Real from Creston. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, perfect. So uh, I run some Angus cows, do some hay farming and some custom silage wrapping. And I don't know, that's probably all you want to hear from me. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Doug. Appreciate your participation. And yeah, Doug's been farming in the Creston Valley for decades and decades. And you do a, a lot of different enterprises. And you're very experimental as well, which we appreciate. Um, Leanne, Leanne Colombo. Good morning, um, Leanne Colombo near Cranbrook. I work for the Ministry of Agriculture in Business Risk Management Branch, and um, I'm also a mostly retired rancher, but we still grow some forage. Great, thank you so much for joining today, Leanne. And Aras Balai Balala. <laughs> Aras um, Palali. Hi, Rachel. I, I've seen you a few times already. Um, yeah, so my wife and I run um, a farm called Caspian Acres, and we moved about a year ago from Kamloops to Kootenays. Uh, we're leasing about uh, 47 acres from the Dukobors near Kalsagar, and we're planning to put an orchard there um, uh, without using any pesticides or herbicides. So we're designing it from the beginning to um, uh, bring heritage varieties and unusual um, new fruit, introduce it to the region, uh, like medlar and persimmon and things like that, as well as some of the common stuff. Uh, I'm really interested in successional planting. So this year we're going to plant a whole bunch of native nitrogen fixers as a uh, earliest start for building soil. So if anybody wants to get involved, uh, I'm to we are totally open to collaboration. And of course, we are really interested in cover crops as well, hoping to plant uh, buckwheat a lot this year. Uh, to help build soil. And yeah, we're always open to uh, connections and collaboration. We are new to the area, but we are doing this full time now, fully committed and living on the land. Uh, thanks, uh, glad to be here. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Aberbrin. Good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to be in this session and I'm happy to see Serena's face. We connected last year in a focus group. Um, I'm the executive director of the Central Kootenai Food Policy Council. I'm based in Nelson, but here today I am uh, as a policy advisor on climate solutions with Farm Folk City Folk, and I'm connected to the National Farmers for Climate Solutions. And we've been working with a whole bunch of technical experts and um, cover cropping is a critical piece in climate action. And so I'm really intrigued in understanding better how it can be used across different sectors and across the landscape of BC, because I do think it's vital important. So the policy piece as well as the practical application is what I'm really interested in. So thank you for putting this on today. Great, hey, thank you, Abra. And David Much. Uh, I'm from Creston and I'm just looking at trying to figure out what to do for a bunch of cows that we have and a bunch of land that we're not going to do export hay on this year. Okay, great. Thank you so much, David, for joining today. And William Shaw. Good morning. My name is William Shaw. I'm the regional agrologist with the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries, and I'm out of Kamloops, and I'm just on to watch and learn. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you for joining. Um, for those who don't know, Kevin Murphy was our regional agrologist here in the Kootenays, and he retired, and they're still working on filling his position. I don't know the status, but we'll probably have a regional agrologist for our region by the summer, fingers crossed. Yeah, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> and Rick Tegert. Good morning all, um, Cal Calf producer here in Radium Hot Springs. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be in part of a couple of the trials with the BC Forage Council. Um, yeah, let's just see what happens today. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Rick. And thanks for participating in the trials. And Alan Gifford. Morning. I'm uh, semi-retired uh, from farming and retired from retail sales. We've been uh, in Grand Prairie uh, selling into the BC Peace and into the northern BC region. Um, I'm still very interested in soils, which is the cover cropping and, and how it will build and, and maintain our, our soils in the future. Hey, thank you so much, Alan. And Morgan Kitchen. Good morning, everyone. Super excited to be here. I'm Morgan, joining from the Unceded State Goose Territory, also known as Vanderhoof, BC, so a little ways away. Um, but I am the Central North BC Land Matcher for the BC Land Matching Program, and my husband and I and our two young kids run a cow-calf operation as well. So excited to learn. Thank you. Fantastic, and thanks for joining from way up north. Uh, there's so much cross-collaboration our regions can do, and uh, it's great to have you here today. Thank you. And Judy Lamb Richardson. Oh, still haven't made friends with figuring out the mic. Okay, <laughs> no problem. I'll move on to the last person, Christina Gates. Oh, from Revelstoke. Christina, are you there? That's fine if you're not able to. Sometimes people have to run down and, you know, let their dogs in or out. And um, Christina's from Revelstoke. I know she's a producer, um, livestock producer up in that neck of the woods. And just in the chat there, we saw that we had Katie joining with the Kidney Livestock Association. And uh, who else? Oh, and then Sabrina, she was with Groundswell and Invermere. So we're at the Columbia Valley. And so it's great to have representation from across the region. And last but not least, Mike Malmberg. I, I skipped you, I saved the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning. It's a, it's a thrill to be here. Um, I'm a retired regional agrologist, so uh, I'm glad to see new folks coming into those positions. Uh, I'm really happy to uh, uh, see this program, uh, cover cropping and uh, basically forage management programs are really important to soils and to the viability of farm operations. And um, I'm primarily interested at this point in time in uh, intensive grazing management for irrigated pastures. Glad to be here. Thank you, Mike, and thanks for you know supporting um, the Farm Advisors and the BC Forage Council for the last five years with extending your knowledge of agricultural extension. It's been, it's great learning from you and collaborating. And without further ado, I would, will pass the mic over to Jillian Baynard. And Jillian, I will let you introduce yourself as well, if you don't mind. Perfect, just gotta get everything organized here, um, just to make sure I'm sharing my screen. Great. Thanks so much for having me here today. So my name is Jillian Baynard. I'm a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Primarily, my research has been taking place in Saskatchewan, uh, which I'd like to acknowledge is on Treaty 4 land and the traditional home of many different First Nations groups. I'm currently living in Harrison Hot Springs, BC, uh, which is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Stalo First Nations and the Coast Salish people. Um, and I'm looking forward to working more in BC and maintaining my work on the prairies. I grew up on a dryland grain farm actually in Southern Alberta. So I'm kind of representing a lot of different areas today as well. So uh, yes, I've been doing quite a bit of work in cover crops for forage systems, um, including some integrated crop livestock systems. And what I wanna do today is just walk through First, I wanna sort of define some of these terms because when you hear these phrases, there's a lot of different um, sort of things they can mean or they mean different things to different people. So I'm gonna describe what they mean in the context I'm using and then just share some experiences um, from the research I've been doing uh, and share some of possible uh, benefits, possible risks, um, and just things to consider when you might be um, wanting to adopt these on farm. So first of all, what are cover crops? 
So the traditional word for or usage of the phrase cover crop are crops that are not typically grown for a cash outcome and rather to provide benefits to the soil or to a following crop. So we can think of that actually being like a cover. That cover can provide benefits simply for um, reduced erosion, perhaps adding nutrients into the soil, um, maybe weed control. And I'll talk more about some of these things along the way. When you hear the phrase green manure, that's a cover crop that's typically really high in legume content. And through the nitrogen fixing action of legumes, you actually can gain that nitrogen addition to the soil. And so we consider this green manure like a plant-based fertilizer. So similar idea, slightly uh, focus more on legumes. You may also hear the phrase polycultures or cocktail mixtures or polycrops. This is actually the area I've been mostly working in over the past several years. And this is when we grow more than one species together. Um, and there's a picture there um, from one of my plots. We typically, um, talk about polycultures as being positive because they represent more natural systems where we increase diversity. So to move away from that idea of a monoculture into something with more diversity that will hopefully have some benefits uh, in different ways, which I'll talk about as well. When we talk about growing cover crops, um, there's also variation in when and how they are grown. So they can be grown at different times. This is going to be interesting depending where you live in Canada. Um, shoulder season cover crops would be a crop that is grown usually immediately before or following a different annual crop. Um, so they can be seeded sort of late summer, early fall for some fall growth. Um, it could be a winter seeded crop that then comes up in the early spring. And again, to try and increase the amount of cover to be year round. In some of the more uh, shorter growing season areas, those, those uh, shoulder season crops are quite difficult. And we can actually talk about an all season cover crop. So one that you would actually include as part of an annual crop rotation uh, and would actually be on the ground for your normal growing season. And there's all variations on those themes as well. If you're talking about a full cover crop, uh, a true cover crop, they can be terminated in a lot of different ways. So they can be mowed, um, I, they can be sprayed out with herbicide, there's things called roller crimpers, which actually kind of break the plant and lay it back down. Um, and I just grabbed a few different pictures off the internet to show the roller crimper on the top and then two different types of mowing on the bottom, um, one being a flail mower um, and the other one that left a, a higher um, stubble height. And, and I, I will also touch a little bit on, on the idea of residue. Just a few other cropping terms that come up. Intercrops are when two or more crops are again grown together, but typically we see some kind of spatial arrangement. So in the picture there, I have rows of oats and rows of peas. Um, and, and sometimes you can have, this might be called row intercropping. Sometimes there's strip intercropping where there's different passes for example, with a cedar of different crops. And sometimes an intercrop actually can be fully mixed. But uh, if we're talking about a cash crop system, there's usually some way to separate those crops. So whether they mature at different times in the season, um, have different growth heights, so you could harvest something off the top, and there's another crop that's closer to the ground, or post-harvest separation, uh, so through seed sorting, um, or like seed cleaning measures where there's enough difference between the crops you're growing that they can be separated. Relay cropping is again growing multiple crops on the same land, uh, but in this case they're grown at different times. So um, something that matures earlier that can be harvested first and then there might be this undergrowth of another crop that matures later in the season um, and again depending on the use can be harvested in different ways. Um, so relay cropping um, might be a little more feasible in areas with shorter growing seasons because it can allow for both crops to grow, but just sort of um, harvest at different dates. 
And what we're here today to talk about specifically are forage cover crops. And what's really nice in a forage system is that these crops that might traditionally be grown just for the benefit of the soil or for the ecosystem services they can provide, you can also get a benefit out of them by harvesting them for forage uh, for your livestock. And so the way this is used can look very different depending on needs, depending on operation. Um, they can be directly grazed on your own farm, for example, um, at different points in the season. They can be swath grazed, they can be baled, depending on what's on the mix, in the mix uh, and how they, sort of that curing idea. Um, some have been silaged. And then in the idea of the crop livestock integration, what we're also seeing is some of these synergies between annual cropping systems where maybe they don't have livestock but are interested in growing a cover crop and also interested in gaining that benefit of having livestock on the land. And the livestock presence, of course, we can have the additional uh, benefit or addition of things like manure and urea. We can have a bit of trampling of the crop residues sort of into that top soil layer. And with that, there are also other concerns, right? That the soil condition needs to be suitable to have animals come onto that land, uh, et cetera. But we're seeing some really neat examples across Canada of farms working together. Um, to, to try out these systems. So the system I work in are these forage cover crops. And this is a, a picture of one of my research trials from Swift Current Saskatchewan. So depending where you're joining me from today, this might look quite different. It's very flat. Uh, it's in the semi-arid brown soil zone of Saskatchewan. So we have very uh, low seasonal moisture. So our um, winters are, are actually our dry season. Uh, and then we have quite low spring and summer moisture as well. The little plots in the background, I'll put my cursor on the screen here. Um, those are, that's actually one of my research trials. And so we test these things in systems to allow us to ask questions in a more controlled setting. But um, I do also really enjoy working on farm with producers because there's a lot more management considerations that have to be made. And it's really nice to see these systems working in real life examples. So today I want to talk a little bit about just basic production of these different forage cover crops, a little bit about nutrition and grazing, and then some soil benefits. And just based on time, I'm going to cover sort of some highlights from each of these areas um, along the way. So let's start by talking about productivity. So as I mentioned, a lot of what I've worked in is having these diverse annual mixtures. And when I talk about diversity, this can literally mean a two species mix all the way up to, I've tested up to 12 species together. And I've talked with producers that sometimes are growing 18 or more. They just kind of take whatever they've got and throw it in the field, or, or maybe they have a really specific recipe they wanna follow. What we find when we increase in diversity, you can improve biomass production over some monocultures. And I say some because obviously if you have something super productive like corn, um, that's a really large biomass producer, it's going to be hard to beat that with, with a different crop. Um, but over some smaller, um, you know, different monocultures, we actually can see this improvement in productivity. I will say in my trials with really diverse mixtures, I haven't found a super obvious advantage to having a lot of species. Um, they do tend to compete and sometimes you don't find a lot of some of the crops that you might have seeded. Um, and what's interesting to or important to consider is what type of representation you have. So we typically talk about functional groups, which are plants that represent different um, sort of they, they provide a different input into the system and they might also have different requirements. So for example, I'm thinking of cool season grasses, things like oats and barley, warm season grasses, that might be corn or millet, legumes, which are your nitrogen fixers, and then brassicas, um, which are things like radishes and turnips. And those are typically sort of the four groups that we tend to see in these forage crop mixtures. And then there can be other things. Um, People grow sunflowers. There's a crop called Phasalia, which is, encourages pollinator visitation. Um, and there's other less common crops that are definitely picking up in interest as well. 
back to my slide here. Um, one thing I'm showing here is an eight species mix in the picture on the left and um, oats monoculture is in the plot on the right. And I promise I didn't tilt the camera <laughs> or do any photoshopping after the fact. This was a really stressful field trial. I, uh, it's not stressful for me, stressful for the plants, a field trial where we had no inputs um, over th for three years in a row. And this is in the third year. And you can see, if you look, you can actually see those oat heads up above the height of the horizon in that eight species mix, whereas in the monoculture, they're definitely shorter and you can't see any of the heads above the height of the horizon. And in this eight species mix, we had two legumes. I had peas and I had hairy vetch. And what you're actually seeing there is that, uh, and other crops, there were brassicas, that's what's flowering, these little pink and white flowers. Um, and then a couple other, um, there was, I believe, millet in this mix as well. But what you're seeing there is that the oat production is improved uh, because of those other crops that are in that mixture, in particular the legumes, which are providing some fertilizer benefits. So we do see um, mixtures having benefits. Another quick side note, in stressful conditions, if you have crop failure of one crop and you're growing a monoculture, you won't have anything left. If you're growing five crops, um, and three of them fail, you might still have two crops growing. Um, that also, you could also have a total crop failure and all five crops might fail. So it's, I'm not saying that's a, a rule, but it is a consideration. As with all farming practices, production is really gonna vary with your weather, your climate and your site conditions. So this is just another example from a trial I ran in Swift Current, the difference in production between uh, 2015 and a 2016 of the exact same crop, it almost doubled. And what you can see, um, if you look at this little precipitation chart here, the um, monthly precipitation, the average is shown in that gray dotted line over 40 years. And here's what the precipitation was in 2015. So very low moisture through April, May, June and higher than average moisture in 2016 through those same months. And you can see a direct correlation with your production. We also see variation, again, based on topography. Um, if you have a variable terrain, often the hilltops that are dry are gonna show lower production and the low spots might have higher production. Again, not anything you probably don't already know, but important to consider that these types of crops respond in the same way as, as other crops will to those stress. For forage production, there are some different late season grazing opportunities. And I know there's a lot of talk right now about trying to extend that grazing season and reduce the amount of time we have to provide, you know, supplemental forage to animals. Um, this is a trial from some of my collaborators. So Bart Lardner at the U of S and his graduate student, Jacqueline Taves, and Alan Iwasa at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. They ran a swath grazing trial uh, and found that these polycultures in the Saskatoon area performed quite comparably uh, in terms of animal daily gains uh, to another typical forage system. In swift current production of that, uh, crop was quite poor and the animals could not be sustained as long as they were hoping on a swath grazing system. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, shoulder season cover crops, um, there's talk of growing something like corn in the summer and having an underseeded ryegrass that then picks up full steam later in the summer. After that cor corn comes off, the ryegrass could be there uh, to provide that late season grazing. Um, and uh, sorry, that's more of the example of relay cropping, I should have said, and then shoulder season cover crops. If you have suitable fall moisture, which in some parts of this, uh, of Canada we do, you could seed something, you know, end of August, early September and get, get enough growth that you're able to graze something there into the fall. This always uh, is an important slide to me is that about seeding considerations. And you will find that there are some uh, seed companies that sort of sell a ready-made mix. Um, and what I always recommend for producers is really take a look at what's that in that mix and really talk to people that might already be growing some of these crops or have tried these mixtures because not everything in that mix is necessarily going to be suited for your local conditions. And that just represents money that you've spent on something that's not going to grow. 
Um, so I think just word of mouth, talking to people, talking to your seed sale reps, they, they know as well. And so um, coming up with a mix that also has the needs for you, what you're looking for. Do you want something that is going to be adding nitrogen into the soil? Or are you looking for something that provides late season growth, et cetera? There is obviously also the challenge of seeding crops with different seed sizes and seeding depth requirements. So in a lot of my research trials, I've actually done uh, sort of an intermediate seeding depth of say three quarter inch um, depth, which is really kind of too shallow for your large seeded crops like peas and corn. And it's really too deep for your small seeded crops uh, like millet or kale, some of those small seeded brassicas. In the picture there, that's millet, uh, the yellow peas and green, and then the red one there is radish, which is sort of an intermediate um, size. What we found with those trials is in a good season year, when you have good seed to soil contact and suitable soil moisture, no problem. I've actually had really good success. In a more difficult condition, we definitely see Im impact of that seeding depth on the growth. So to get around that, there's a couple different methods I've seen used or that we've tried ourselves, um, is to use the fertilizer, like the side banding shoot, if you have that on your seeder, you could run the small seeded uh, crops that way. So you can have two different depths. Um, some people simply do two passes, do all the big seeded stuff first, small seeded stuff again. Um, also, just depending on your how your seed drill is set up, if you have different boxes, you can sort the seed that way. Um, I've also seen it all just thrown into one tank. And it comes out surprisingly evenly, even though the seeds are different sizes in there. And then I've also uh, seen some really unique sort of homemade contraptions where someone's taken an old seed drill and, and rigged up hosing and, and um, boxes to make sure that they can do multiple seeding depths for these different crops. So just something to, to keep in mind. And all of these things lead to then that your selected seeding rate is not necessarily going to be what comes up. Some of this is due to those seed conditions, uh, what's suitable for your area. And then also a little bit of basic competition. So for example, corn hates crowding and it really doesn't, even though you'd think it should be so strong and tough, um, in some of the trials I've grown, you'll just see corn growing around the borders of the field because uh, it really doesn't like to be. So that's also, again, a representation of something you've probably put a lot of money uh, and effort into that you might not realize. A little bit about weed control. So this is a big one. So it's really exciting when you consider some of these forage crops. Uh, some of them are really high potential for weed suppression. So those brassicas like forage radish, forage radish and turnip, they have really uh, big leaves. They grow rapidly. They can really shade out the ground below them and they can provide some really good weed competition. Barley and triticale, um, also show good weed suppression, partly through their growth, and also all of these types of crops have the potential for allelopathy, which is that idea of the crops actually um, releasing root exudates that uh, deter other plants from growing near them. So these ones, there's some good potential, and I've done some trials that have shown some suitable um, weed control measures. However, I have to temper that with the fact that weeds can easily get out of control in these systems, especially if you're ever growing a grass and a broadleaf together, your um, ability for chemical control, if you're using chemical control, is um, non-existent. And because of the way they grow, uh, the seasonality of their growth, if, if the weeds are able to establish, uh, it can cre create some big problems down the road. And a good example of that is under really trying circumstances. The picture I have shown here, uh, this is from one of my research trials last year in 2021, which was extremely dry over a lot of Canada. And we had a severe drought in Southern Saskatchewan. And you can see the, the crop mixture I have growing here. I believe it was an eight species mix. It's probably some oats and barley up here at the top of the picture. Here's a brassica in the middle. Uh, and everything else here is kochia and, and lamb's quarters. And it was such uh, dry, there was just really no soil moisture. The weed seed bank was there. So the weeds germinated and emerged first and our crop could never really catch up and keep up and, and out compete. And it was so much so that people were like, 
complaining that our, <laughs> our trial was so weedy when it was a common problem for uh, on farm and on research farms. Um, so certainly uh, not a surprise, but something to be aware of. And then one last note about weeds is that some actual cover crops themselves can be weedy. So hairy vetch is a really popular legume option. Um, it can have a really um, abundant growth. It's quite digestible and high in protein. Um, it's marketed typically as an annual crop, but it really acts more like a biannual. And we do see it coming back the following season, which in a forage system, not a big deal. If you were putting this land back into an annual crop, that might be a deterrent. Uh, also because hairy vetch has super variable seed size, so it's really hard to get out of, out of your seed if it does show up in what you've harvested. And so here's just an example of that trial um, after the animals grazed it. You can see they grazed anything that was cropish uh, quite heavily and they nipped the tops off of some of these kochia plants, but almost everything you're seeing in this in this picture are weeds. So um, really not a nice situation to end up in. Okay, so let's, I started talking a little bit about nutrition, so let's jump right into that. So similar to productivity, same with nutrition, we can actually improve nutrition compared to some monocultures um, or at least maintain that forage nutrition. And it depends on what you include in that mix in your crop. So um, I've put some red circles here around some peas, hairy vetch, and a brassica. I think this was tillage radish. Both of those legumes and brassicas are highly digestible and high in protein. And just uh, this is an example of some of our nutrients we looked at um, from a trial that we ran in partnership with the Manitoba Beef and Forage Initiatives, which is in Brandon, Manitoba. So just a little shout out to them. Just showing the shift in some of these micronutrients and things like nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, um, and then the ADF and NDF fiber uh, fractions there. And you can see that our mixtures, again, this was compared to an oats monoculture, really increased a lot of the different levels and, and then lowered that fiber. Now, I put in here, get a feed test. This is important too, because as you can see, things like calcium and copper really shifted. And depending on what type of livestock you have grazing these plants, you're gonna to wanna to make sure, you know, what type of, are they lactating or are they pregnant um, to make sure that those nutrient levels are in a, uh, and a balance that you're comfortable with. Um, and also another comment about the highly digestible crops is um, really you do see, um, you know, very loose stool and, and ruminant animals actually value some roughage in their diet, right, to make that rumen function properly. So it's finding a nice balance between having some of those more typical cereal crops as well as some of these other things mixed in. Another note of caution is that mixtures high in brassicas might have um, excessively high levels of nitrate and sulfur. Um, and this is particularly a concern with some of those late season grazing scenarios. So this is a picture again from Alan Iwasa's swath grazing trial. You can see there's snow on the ground, but there's little bits of green poking up through the soil or through the snow, and that's all brassicas. They are quite frost tolerant and they regrow after grazing. So again, even though you might have it in a mix to begin with, it, that might not be the proportion that they're being grazed in. And this bar graph, I know it's a bit small, but this is also from Alan's work, just shows the red line there is the safe level for nitrates, and the gray bars are the level of nitrates that they measured in these different brassica samples. Um, and then sulfur is the blue line and the black bars, you can see some of them are also over that. So again, importance of getting a feed test. And um, what I recommend is just don't probably graze them in monoculture. Um, and to, to, uh, I will say in all of our trials we've done and with my various collaborators, none of us have ever had issues with toxicity. Like we've never lost animals due to this, but it is something to be aware of. Another thing about those brassicas and some of these other new crops, depending on what type of a herd you have, animals might show a really strong dislike for some of these crops. So this is from one of our grazing trials in Swift Current. Um, we had yearling steers go out on the trial 
And on August 6th here, you can see that like the steer just looks upset. Uh, you know, there's nothing to graze. They've picked off all the things that they kind of knew, the oats, the barley. Um, they didn't even really like the peas in this trial, to be honest. And then here's all this big leafy brassicas that they just wouldn't touch. And so uh, in a research setting, we did we were uncomfortable um, leaving them there too long. So we uh, I think we had 10 animals on this trial and just dropped it down to three. And what's really interesting is those three animals that stayed on the trial, actually, and I should say those animals were losing weight. That was the other concern we had. Um, but the animals that stayed on the trial actually started having really good average daily gains. They started eating everything. And in September 18th, we had released them sort of through the same mixture, but uh, in three separate paddocks over time. And by, you know, a little over a month later, they were eating everything down evenly. And the first section that was grazed is what's shown in the subset picture here. And there's an example of the tremendous amount of regrowth from those brassicas. And there you can see a steer quite happily eating them. The other thing that happens is that palatability changes over time. So these brassicas apparently get sweeter. I haven't tried them myself, <laughs> but post frost, uh, they actually increase in sweetness and improve in palatability. I've also heard from a producer who was running a cow-calf herd on um, some of these mixtures, and they never showed any preference concerns with these brassicas at all, until one year randomly, they suddenly didn't like it. And so I think that you're also going to see some palatability shifts depending on seasonal moisture, um, other growing conditions that might change how those uh, plants actually taste. So something to keep in mind. This also is probably going to be less of a concern when you have high stocking rates. So this is an on-farm trial I ran with Dwayne Thompson, who has Two T Ranch, which is near Kelleher, which is near Saskatoon and Saskatchewan. He has a very large herd of about 1,100 cow-calf pairs and with bulls, and he has a super dynamic farm system of some perennials, some annuals, some annual crop systems, and, and he was really excited to work with me to try some of these mixtures. And what you can see is just the tremendous number of animals that came on this trial. So they came in on the morning on August 9th. And by that afternoon, you can see they already showed preference similarly for the simple mix in this case, case which was oats and peas, which was more familiar to them. And I think if you look in that picture, you can see there's quite a big area uh, they're even a little more congregated on that left side of the picture. And on the right side of the picture, the complex mix, which had more brassicas, um, legumes, and millet was in there. Uh, they were a little slower to graze. However, in this high pressure system, they put their head down and eat what's in front of them. And by the time they left, there was like a nice trample down that was very even uh, across the whole site. So again, going to be very different for different operations. This also brings in some different uh, ideas for grazing strategies. So that slide I just showed you is from 2019. Last year in 2021, what Duane tried was a twice over grazing scenario. Um, so here the cattle grazed the, the crop again uh, in July. So earlier, not at full production potential, but there was a considerable amount of regrowth. And this is his son here. You can see by October, the animals ended up grazing at the end of the month. Uh, there was quite a substantial amount of production again. So that also represents um, opportunity based on the timing needs of your operation. Um, and in Dwayne's case, because he runs this large herd kind of all over his farm, it worked out that they could go through this pasture, you know, go to other fields and then come back on their way back to the farm. So again, um, just lots of opportunities. So for my last little bit here, I want to talk about soil benefits. So this is probably what you're going to hear a lot of these days through the regenerative agriculture movement and holistic agriculture. There's a lot of talk and a lot of presentation of the very uh, positive things that can happen when you grow these cover crops. And some of these include increased soil nutrients, so things like nitrogen, increased carbon sequestration, and uh, improvement of soil organic material. Um, also, some of the physical soil, soil characteristics, like water infiltration, those brassicas um, and big rooted crops, 
they actually, when they break down, it almost looks like a sponge, like a loofah in the soil. You can see all the fibrous sort of root material there, but the rest of it's kind of hollowed out. So it makes a really nice um, way for water to get down through, especially if you have something like a hard pan layer or something. Um, increased soil aggregation. Um, some of these crops are suggested to have root exudates that help the soil stick together a little better, which can reduce your erosion potential. So a lot of these things, and I think there is good evidence for a lot of these, but again, we want to test them and look for them. So I want to highlight a trial I did to really look at this. Um, so some of the other ones I've shown you are sort of, you know, what, what does the crop look like now for forage? What does it look like now for grazing? In this trial, it was really looking at what happens after you grow these crops. So in 2018, we seeded a trial with three different mixes, which are shown in the pictures there. Something I called a balanced mix that had two cereals, two legumes, and two brassicas. A nitrogen fixing mix, which was just three legumes. And then a weed control mix, which had a higher proportion of brassicas. We then seeded these three different crops with three different fertilizer rates of actual N. So no added nitrogen, 60 pounds per acre and 120 pounds per acre, which would be very high. And then three residue levels. So after these crops grew, we either went in and removed all of the biomass. So what you might do in a baling system 50%, which might be like a take half, leave half scenario in a grazing situation, or you could bale it that way too. And then we left one as a true cover crop where we um, mowed the crop and returned all of, we used a flail mower, so it chopped it all up and we returned it back to the soil surface. And so we didn't take any of the material off the site. So um, these next slides, I do have some bar graphs, um, so don't feel overwhelmed. I'm just going to talk about them and, and highlight the key points. So everything grew fine in 2018. So in 2019, in the spring, we went back in and took a look and we took some soil samples. The soil nitrates were definitely linked with the amount of fertilizer applied the previous year, not rocket science, uh, and also the amount of residue left behind. Um, and I had a really good question when I gave this presentation another time. This is represented in parts per million. And if we want to put this back into pounds per acre, uh, you, can, you can actually just double it. So if this is roughly around, you know, seven parts per million, that would look like about 14 pounds per acre of nitrogen. So you would, this would still be, um, you know, you would probably still expect to fertilize something. Uh, in this situation. But you can see that the more fertilizer we had the previous year, the more um, nitrates were available in the soil. And this one is really nice to see the, the more residue you left. And it's very stepwise, right? So the, as you increase that residue, you increase the amount of nitrates available. What was interesting to me is in the spring, so immediately following that previous year, the different crop mixtures did not have an effect on soil nitrate. So it didn't matter if it was the control, or sorry, the balanced mix, the nitrogen fixing, or the weed control. Um, they didn't have an impact in the spring, but I'll come back to that. So then we seeded a wheat, a wheat crop over the whole field site. And what you can see, and probably just directly based on those available nutrients there, and sorry, we didn't apply any additional fertilizer. We just put, the, put it in just a wheat crop. You can see that the um, amount of residue and the amount of fertilizer that was there the previous year directly improved wheat yield. So we can see that the highest bar is under the 100% residue and the uh, 120 pounds per acre of nitrogen. No significant difference, again, based on, on the crop. And this picture just shows the little People like to see the little mini combines we use <laughs> for plot research. They're kind of kind of cool to see. Now here's where it gets interesting. In following that wheat crop, we went back and soil sampled again. Soil nitrate was still correlated with residue, so I haven't shown that bar graph, but it was now associated with the previous crop. And you can see the highest level of soil nitrates were found under that nitrogen fixing mix, which you might expect based on the number of legumes we had there. What's interesting to me is that this didn't show up until that following fall, which is probably a sign of the time it takes for the breakdown of those crop residues uh, and of those nitrogen 
fixing legumes and the material they were leaving behind is probably being released over the season. And now we're seeing it more later in that uh, growing season after the wheat was taken off. We also saw now, and which we didn't see in the spring, but now in the fall, that soil carbon and soil moisture were also correlated with the crop that was seeded the previous year. So this is really nice. You see a really good increase in soil carbon based on the nitrogen fixing mix. So the one in the center bar here is the nitrogen fixing mix and it's significantly um, higher, more carbon than under the balanced or the weed control mix. And similarly for soil moisture, the highest soil moisture was under the nitrogen fixing mix. Now I didn't touch on soil moisture from the spring data, there were some impacts. What's interesting with soil moisture is you can sort of see two things. One, you can see that the residue actually does directly impact soil moisture. So there's more soil moisture when you have higher levels of residue. So you're just going to reduce that evapotranspiration and loss. I have heard concerns though as well, for example, more with a shoulder season cover crop, that that crop you're growing is going to be using some of your available moisture. So there's kind of a balance to consider there. Um, and so again, interesting, in this case, I also wonder if there, the nitrogen fixing mix probably used the least amount of moisture in 2018. And so there might have actually just been better residual moisture uh, moving forward into the fall. But showing that there are that what you grow and how you manage it the previous year, of course, will impact what grows the next year. So we went back one more year in 2020, and this time we seeded a pea crop over the entire trial. No fertilizer, no inoculant. And what we found is that there were still impacts from that 2018 seeded crop. And in this case, it was actually a negative impact. The pea yield was only affected by the cropping mix from two years previous. And in particular, it was this nitrogen fixing mix that had the poorest yield. And that's probably a representation of pathogenicity and just buildup of soil pathogens. And we know that, right, from annual crop rotations, you don't want to grow peas too close to each other. And in this case, even with that two year gap, we're still seeing the impact of having legumes seeded too, cro too closely together in time. So in this case, we saw a negative impact. And at this point, there was no impact of residue, no impact of fertilizer. So even those differences we were seeing in the fall of 2019 no longer exist. And so for all, similarly for all of those soil measures, there was no difference in the nitrates, no difference in the carbon um, and other ones that we measured as well. So I, show, I bring this up to show the timeline, and this is also going to really depend on where you're farming and the types of moisture and soil conditions you have. You will hopefully see some benefits, um, but they might not be very long-lived. And, and to consider that some of these mixtures or these cover crops are silver bullets or are going to fix a problem uh, in a certain field might not be the case. It might work in the short term, not the long term. Uh, but of course, you can consider other ways to, to work that into your system as well. So with that, so I don't talk too much longer, I'll just give you some of my final thoughts. As with all farming, um, production of these diverse forage mixtures or less diverse mixtures is really going to depend on where you're growing and what kind of climate and weather you have. Um, and to recognize that there are a lot of management considerations with these um, forage cover crops. Um, I think ideally we would like to think we could just throw something in and let it happen, but in reality they're actually quite complicated, um, especially around weed control. There's some definite risks. Nutrition, there's some risks there uh, that have to be considered uh, if you want to be grazing these trials or feeding these trials. And then my biggest point there is just talk with other people. So I often get asked, well, what should I grow? Or how many species? What's the best number? Um, and it's really extremely variable. So talk to people in your area who might have tried some of these crops. Um, and then also I say, consider starting small. So with some producers, starting with something diverse might be an oats and peas mix. Uh, might be something that's just a little bit different what they're already doing. 
or maybe consider those four functional groups like I mentioned, like a cool season, a warm season, a legume, and a brassica, just to try seeing how that impacts your operation. And also start small in terms of land base. First see what, what grows, kind of do a little test strip in a corner somewhere um, and, and try it out um, so that if you do experience some of the potential risks with weeds getting out of control or poor production uh, that you haven't you know, backed yourself into a corner with trying something new. So I think there's a lot of positives uh, and I think this is a really nice direction, but also to recognize the risks and to have some cautions when you're approaching these systems. So with that, I just wanna thank all the people who helped me. Dustin and Brian are my technicians with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada who are on the ground collecting samples. We hire a lot of summer students. It's a really great opportunity to bring them into the agricultural realm. Uh, and of course they help us a lot. I uh, mentioned some of the research from Alan and Bart and Akilu is also one of our collaborators in Swift Current. Dwayne is the farmer I've worked with and other producer collaborators I'm very grateful for. And then also just wanted to mention Manitoba Beef and Forage Initiatives, which um, have one of our research sites at their farm and who we're really excited to work with uh, also for this extension piece and, and reaching out to uh, farmers in different areas and to share about the work we're doing. So with that, and thank you again so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk. I love getting questions and talking with people. So I've put my email address there on the slide. Uh, and certainly please feel free to reach out uh, if you have any questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jillian. Um, I, I am anticipating that folks do have questions, but we are going to move straight into Erin's presentation so we can sort of take two. Maybe Erin's growing experience will answer some of your questions. And while Erin gets her screen share up and going, um, I will ask you Leanne's question because it, it's very relevant specifically to that legume issue. And it asks, so other legume had negative impacts on peas two years later. Good question. Yeah, so in the nitrogen fixing mix, I had peas, hairy vetch, and something called bursine clover. So it was peas on peas, uh, but it was with a little more diversity. But typically, I think some of the you know, pathogen buildup you'll see will be kind of common across across different legumes. Um, so it, it was, it was, but it still did include peas. That's a, a good point to make. And I will just quickly say, uh, in the prairies, we have a, especially in Swift Current in that dry, dry semi-arid region, we have a really hard time finding annual legumes um, that perform well. So we do resort a lot to things like peas and hairy vetch. But to recognize there's lots of other clover options um, that might have better growth in, in other areas of the country for sure. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jillian. And yeah. I look forward to more Q&A at the end. And if you wouldn't mind just dropping your email in the chat box there, that was a, a question from one participants. So thank you. And uh, yeah, there. we have a very arid climate as well in many parts of the QE. So very relevant, your last comment there about types of legumes that can grow without irrigation here. Um, so it's my absolute pleasure to turn the reins over to Erin Harris. She's a producer at Kootenai Meadows Organic Farm. And Erin, I will let you take it away. Okay, I take it you can see my screen then if you're... It looks great, yeah, it's full screen. Yeah, you, you succeeded. <laughs> Um, so yeah, my name is Erin Harris. I'm a dairy farmer in Creston um, and we've been experimenting with some different um, cover cropping, particularly uh, fall rye, roller crimping um, and uh, Andrew Bennett, especially from Kootenai Boundary Farm Advisors has helped us out a lot with it. Um, and the cool drone imagery is all from him um, from this uh, spring of 2020 when we were seeding through it. So yeah, I'll just talk about what we've been doing here. Um, if I know how to advance my slides, maybe. Um, so just, yeah, why we've sort of been experimenting with cover crops. Um, we're on heavy clay soils in Lister um, and just increasingly seeing a lot of drought. So trying to build up our soil organic matter. Um, so we've got some resiliency uh, in the face of that. Uh, we want to try and break some of our pest cycles. We're certified organic. So 
we have sort of less tools in our toolkit sometimes in terms of pests. Um, in Lister, we're really experiencing a lot of issues with alfalfa weevil leaf hoppers and aphids in um, our alfalfa crops. And so hoping both using different crops and diversifying our stands, we're able to break some of those pest cycles. Um, as well as I want to try and minimize tillage and soil damage in our organic system. Um, again, uh, no-till is a little harder in organics. We don't have the option to desiccate. Um, so trying to utilize things like roller crimping to make that work. Um, so this is, we have a roller crimper that we had custom built by this ProCut Industries. Uh, his name is Brad Isaacs. Um, he's pretty incredible in terms of what he can do. So it's built on the model that the Rodale Institute has. The, they have a free specs on their uh, website and that's how we built ours. Um, so yeah, it's, this is a, it's a, ours is a three point hitch roller crimper. Ideally it would be in front of the tractor so that you don't have your wheels hitting the crop before the roller crimper, but we don't have a front mount three point hitch. So we've gone with a rear mount for now. And then we hook our cedar behind. And in this picture, this was actually the second year we've done this. Uh, we trained a second cedar behind and offset it by three and a half inches to try and uh, shrink row spacing. But so yeah, that's sort of our roller crimping setup. Um, so yeah, our first year was 2019. I don't have a lot of good pictures from right when I was rolling it, but this is actually in, this is like at the end of the season, this was a field day we were doing. So you can see it established okay, but it's thinner than we would like. And it's partially because we were using a, a no-till cedar with a seven inch row spacing. So there's still quite a bit of holes in there. Um, and you can see from this top picture, a lot of alfalfa. So we usually seed um, a 70% alfalfa, 30% grass mix. Um, and we use both orchard grass and soft leaf tall fescue. Um, we're finding with the roller crimping, very little grass is establishing. Um, I'm not sure if that's because of the allelopathy or if it's because of just how hard that mat is to get through. I think that um, potentially our grass is germinating, but then it's not able to punch through because um, it's not as strong of a seedling as, as our forages. So that's those sort of are, is the images from our first year. Um, that same year I established that field and a dry land field at the same time. We find our, so 2020, sort of like that first year post-establishment year, we generally get very low yields on both dry land and rolled. Um, but then this is comparing 2021. So that's the, it's been in for two years. It was seeded in 2019. Um, and the rolled field actually did 113% um, in terms of versus our dry land. So we got five and a half ton per acre versus 4.9 ton per acre on the dry land field. Um, first cut was particularly high um, like on the rolled field compared to dry land. Um, and we experienced pretty extreme drought conditions in the spring of 2021. And so I think what happened was the rolled mat increased that moisture retention and kept those soils uh, cool during the heat waves. And that's what really um, got us that high yielding first cut. Um, second and third cut on the dry land were actually a bit higher. And I think that has to do with plant density and the grass in the mix. So that's still working on, um, like say where we've had some issues with patchiness and just um, row space um, on the, the rolled field because on our dry land field we established with a brilliant cedar so it's significantly smaller uh, row spacing. Um, and then this is our second sort of trial of the roller crimping. So this, um, that first picture at the fall of 2019, we broadcast seed our fall rye. Um, we could just cover a lot more ground when we're broadcast seeding and we kind of want it to be have very little um, row space 
and be a really dense mat. We probably were a bit excessive in our seed um, placement. We were probably over 200 pounds to the acre. We, we clean our own seed on farm. So we just pour seed onto that field. Um, was likely a little bit excessive. And then this bottom picture, that same field, and that's the spring of 2020 when we started to roll through there. So I was, for most of the field, I was over the cab of the tractor while I was rolling. Um, so nice, beautiful um, crop of fall rye. Um, Andrew and I took some measurements and it was over 10,000 pounds of dry matter um, on the, on the, map that we were rolling in. So the changes we made in year two was we had added weight to the roller crimper. Um, in the first year I found I had a ton of volunteer rye so we um, were able to improve termination by adding a weight. Um, we put that second seater behind to try and close the roll width. Uh, we added a rake on the front of the seater because we were finding that there was a lot of lodging because it was so tall um, and that where it would lodge, the cedar would kind of skip. So we added a rake to the front of it that pulled the rye straight and improved the seed penetration. And then we have increased the diversity in our seed varieties for our forages. So like say, we're really struggling with pests in Lister, particularly in alfalfa because there's a ton of alfalfa grown by ourselves but and by all producers. So now in our forage mix, we're growing sane foin, red clover, alfalfa, orchard grass, and softleaf tall fescue um, to try and just um, make our fields a little more resilient. Um, so yeah, this was the rolling that rye. Uh, this picture, you can really see how um, lodged that rye was. And if you look sort of beside my tractor, you can see how it has been sort of pulled straight ahead of the cedar. Um, so that seemed to work fairly well. Um, and again, just this is, yeah, rolling that same field. Uh, and that's, this is the mat on the ground. And when you're pulling it apart, it's a couple inches thick. Um, so it, we find it's really hard to get your seed depth set correctly and to get any real yeah, any real consistency in seed depth. So that's that's definitely a challenge with this um, because certain chunks of your field are uh, denser than others in terms of your rye mat, um, The any lodging can cause issues. So that's a challenge with it. Um, and then with our diverse blend, it's also a challenge because they have slightly different seed depth needs. So, um, our agronomist suggested that probably a bit shallower was better because even if some of it ended up in that mat, it kind of gets shaken down. Um, and that sort of worked. Um, I think there were some problems in terms of seed soil contact with some of our smaller uh, seeded crops in there. Um, so this is the sort of results of that first, of that second year establishment. So like say the large seeded crops established quite well. So I don't know if you can really see these pictures that well, but that's predominantly sandfoin and red clover that established um, in the first year. And they, it looks really patchy. It really thickened up afterwards, but um, so yeah, sandfoin and red clover was super strong. But again, very little to no grass established. And the, the alfalfa was pretty poor in the first year. Um, this is, and then, but then in 2021, we got 4.4 ton to the acre um, in that field, which like say, so sort of for that first year afterwards, that's significantly higher than we normally would have gotten. Um, the alfalfa came in in, in fall of 2020 and spring of 2021, we really saw that establishment um, kick off. So that's where I think that it actually didn't get proper seed soil contact because it wasn't that the alfalfa germinated and then died. It was that it never germinated at all. It wasn't until the fall of that year and the spring of the next year that it really started to uh, establish. And you'd really notice it walking through the field 
that the Samfoy and Red Clover was definitely like a year more mature than we had a lot of little baby alfalfas coming. Um, the Samfoy, it has a lot of potential for our cropping system. Um, the cows seem to really like the Samfoy bales that we've fed. Um, and it, it's beautiful in terms of its uh, potential for pollinators, as well as it is a self, you can get it to self seed as a legume. So it has some potential for establishing longer uh, forage blends for us. Um, this one I did not take any pictures of because it was a very depressing failure. Um, so this was a, another field that we roller crimped, um, the same as the one with all the pictures, and it was essentially a complete failure. Um, the mat was significantly less dense um, in this field, and I really struggled with seed depth because of that, because there was it was really patchy as well as it's a bit hillier of a field, um, but I only got half a ton per acre yield on the field. Um, we are seeing alfalfa establishing now slowly as well, but um, it was it it was not a good field. Um, so then I'm just going to touch on some of the other sort of stuff we're doing. Uh, so I'm doing some rye grazing and no-till seeding grasses through it for establishing uh, dry land uh, pasture for our dry cows. Um, it was a bit of a whoopsies, to be honest. Um, when she was talking previously about starting small, something we're really terrible at at our place, we did 20 acres the first year we rolled rye, and the next year we went to roll rye, we thought 120 seemed like a logical scale up. So we seeded too much rye and we couldn't keep up with it. Um, for us, rolling rye happens right after first cut um, and we just didn't have the manpower or the equipment to get it all rolled at the right time. Um, so what we ended up doing is I grazed the dry cows and heifers through it and then I've zero tilled in a uh, dry land grass blend. Um, and I've done that twice where we've grazed and then um, seeded, grazed and then seeded. Um, and the grass is slowly establishing as well as um, the rye is dropping seed heads. So it's sort of continuing to be a nurse crop. Um, and then I'm hoping to slowly be able to graze it out or mow it out. Um, though fall rye is one of those things that it's amazing, but it's almost impossible to kill sometimes organically. Um, I think intensive grazing would greatly increase this method. Um, this field is sort of range pasture. So we I don't move these heifers and dry cows very often, but looking at establishing more strip grazing on here this year, um, because I think that we'll, we'll see really good grass establishment underneath if I can hit this rye really um, hard and intensively and then move off of it. Um, so then we've also experimented with um, going from winter wheat to a blended silage mix to a turnip radish cover crop. Um, so again, spring of 2021, the severe drought just meant that our wheat heads were pretty unlikely to fill properly, as well as we were prioritizing forage production. If necessary, we can buy in um, grain from the prairies, but it's very difficult to bring in certified organic forages, um, and that's 85-90% um, of our diet. So, um, and then we also had weed challenges in our winter wheat fields. I think partially due to the drought, um, they were just really stressed and really unhappy in the spring. So um, we took that wheat as hay um, and silage, and then in one of our fields, we zero tilled in a blend of sorghum, millet, sunflower, buckwheat, radish, and turnip. Um, and that was in an irrigated field. So we, we knew we could get water onto it. Um, and then in our dry land fields, I zero tilled in millet and buckwheat, uh, both of which should establish in dry conditions um, and had sort of the most potential for biomass accumulation. Um, and then, so this is the irrigated field in September of 2021. Um, it was a beautiful crop. Um, it was all uh, just over the cab of the tractor, this sorghum, millet, sunflower blend, um, as well as really well-established buckwheat, 
um, and turnips and radishes in the understory of the, um, the seeding. So we were really happy with it. We ran over it twice with water. Um, so we did have to, to, to water to really get it to go. Um, but yeah, and then, so then we bailed that up as silage. Um, and yeah, between the wheat silage and that silage blend, we got just over seven ton to the acre, um, which is a lot for us in Lister here. Um, it was, it's beautiful feed. And then the turnips and radish, um, continue to regrow after cutting. Um, they could be grazed in the fall and we had kind of considered that if, um, if the drought had continued, we, we luckily did get moisture in late summer. Um, but, um, because, it, but then also because it got wet, we couldn't graze it. Um, again, we're on super heavy, sticky clay soils. And the last thing I wanted to do was put cows out um, in that field and just make a mess of it and them. Um, and then there what we were worried over the nitrates um, in those brassicas if we'd have issues uh, with our dry stock. Um, but then just decided to leave it, which it will add hopefully a lot of great organic matter to the field. And it's helping open up that soil and sort of stabilize it over the fall or fall and winter. Um, and so yeah, this is one of my my turnips um, from this field uh, and that sort of, you can see the field in the background and then that's a closer up of field. Um, do have some weed issues in this field. There's that some quack grass and some, I call it bindweed. I don't know if that's actually the real term for that uh, little weed, um, but it, it's, it's a beautiful, like what the residue that's been left there considering we still got seven tons to the acre off that field. So um, yeah, that's that one. Um, the dry land fields, again, I didn't take any pictures of the failure fields, but uh, the millet and the buckwheat was a, a complete failure. We got no establishment at all. Um, 2021 was an extreme summer for us. But uh, yeah, we, we had a little bit of it germinate, but nothing got more than an inch tall. So we didn't get any feed out of that. So that was unfortunate. Um, so the future of what we're doing, um, I would like to look at roller crimping and putting in some larger seeded forages. So potentially looking at putting in sandfoin and forage oats or sandfoin and some of that dry land blend um, so that we get a crop in the first year of it and then in the fall seeding in our alfalfa and grasses so that maybe we'll get a better, a better utilization of that seed right when it's seeded. Um, right now, we kind of you invest in the alfalfa seed, but then it takes two years to become anything. So looking at trying to utilize some annual forages during the establishment phase um, that sort of can be cut out over time and no-till in a couple other ones um, and then the, yeah we're going to keep using sort of more diverse crops um, utilizing a few more annual forages um, to try and increase the organic matter in our soils but also break those pest cycles um, and then one other thing that I'm going to try is some roller crimping of triticale uh, we seeded a lot of it this year um, and thinking it might have less allelopathic effect on potentially the grasses and the alfalfa, as well as just, um, yeah, it, if we can make it work as well um, and not have as much volunteer as we do with the rye. So yeah, that's our, our cover cropping and experimenting. Wow, thanks so much, Erin. Uh, your images were so fantastic and really spoke to the incredible work you've been trialing out there and also your record keeping that, that has some yield data to also share with us. So congratulations on all your experimental work in the Lister area. And I would like to open the floor to questions from the audience. You can unmute your phones, you can type it into the chat. I know we did have one question while people wet their whistles was just to confirm that all of this was done in the Lister area. Yeah. Yeah, okay. 
And then I think there was one more. Oh, it was just a comment from Leanne just saying that, you know, Sandpoint is known to be difficult to establish. So it must like Lister. And I've, I've heard the same thing that Sandpoint can be difficult to establish. So congratulations on getting a good catch. Um, Serena, I see you have a question. Yeah, it's very selfish. <laughs> uh, so the BC Forge Council actually just set up a research plot in Prince George uh, of fall rye. We seeded it last year and got a really good catch. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm really interested in a few things because we heard from a couple locals that they're like, yeah, our fall rye actually lasted us eight years and we couldn't kill it, <laughs> which was a good thing. Like they got good use out of it. But uh, so we actually split the field in half and did two different seeding levels, one with the intention of grazing the field, the other to roller current and kind of compare how the process works for both. And I guess uh, just from how did you guys sort out the timing of crimping for the fall rye? Was it really based on the phenology of where the fall rye was at or was it kind of just based on other management considerations for the, for the farm itself? We based it on, um, yeah, where the fall rye was at in terms of its growth, um, right, as it was starting to drop pollen, um, is from what I understand, is when you'll get the best, um, like, kill with your crimper. Um, so, it, yeah, it's very doughy, um, and you're sort of just dropping that pollen uh, is when we were doing it. Okay, that was our plan, too, um, but we'll find out. <laughs> Yeah, like I say, it's a bit of a, at least here, that timing is a bit of a challenge. It's a management uh, issue with the other things going on on the farm. Yeah, uh, we're extremely privileged in that we're just rejuvenating all these fields that haven't been in production for 20 years, and there's no other time constraints or farm activities surrounding that field. So we hopefully will be able to reach it at the right time, but uh, good to know. Thank you. Um, I have a question about irrigation. Uh, the fall rye was non-irrigated, correct, Erin? Yeah, that was dry land. That was dry land. And then the 2021 annual cocktail with the turnips and radish and stuff, that was irrigated, correct? Yeah. 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 And, and just anecdotally, from what you know about the Kootenays and everything, would you say that for those annual cocktails, such as the radish mix and everything, irrigation is pretty much necessary? Like, do you know of instances where we could do dry land annual cocktails like that? I think we might be able to do it um, if they were seeded a little earlier. Um, so we were like, we took that week hay off. The whole summer was such a blur because it was so hot. And actually, Doug might be able to tell me when we took that off because he bailed it for me. But um, it was, it, the soils were really, really hot and dry when we seeded at that point. Um, so that's where like, I'm interested in if you roll or crimp rye and then put some of that cocktail mix in, I think that moisture retention and keeping that soil cool, you might be able to get establishment. Um, because we grow, like we grow forage oats dry land, um, works quite well. And so millet and buckwheat should, um, grow fine dry land and even sunflower should but we were just it was just bad timing and insanely hot right like it was 40 degrees when you're trying to see that so it's nothing was happy yeah and I you know that it's a great answer and you know I guess it like so many things it depends mm -hmm. and I feel like with the climate variability we're experiencing here you know across the whole province that's the gamble these days with the cover cropping on these dry land situations is that the timing is so important, you know, regarding soil moisture. And if you can get on those fields and there's a bit of a gamble there and that's through my discussions with producers, that's what um, we talk a lot about is soil moisture. And if we can get these uh, dry land uh, cover crops established, depending on the season and yeah, you just don't know really what you're going to get. And, you know, fall seeding has been explored by some producers as well, but then that depends obviously on, on the crop you're trying to grow as well. So thank you for that, Erin. That's, um, it seems like maybe this year we'll have a wet spring, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> um, Jillian, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna jump in and just essentially second what you both said. Um, 
obviously in swift current there it's semi-arid and all of my trials were not irrigated they're all dry land um and i would say some years actually people were really surprised they would sort of say oh how did you get this to grow and, and it was really chancy and even last year the images i showed of the what we call the total wreck the all the weeds and the patchiness um there was another producer probably very similar, low moisture, grew a really diverse cover crop and had excellent production. So if it's just, like you said, that timing, that seed to soil contact, if they got one chance spring shower that we didn't, or had a little better residual moisture than we did, it's really hard to predict. But I would say there's still lots of potential in dry land systems, um, at least because that's only what I've worked in. So I would still say there is some potential there.